This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Welcome, Talk Catholic, the website, dot com, your host, Tim Kilcoyne. No agendas here, just the straight and narrow, through Mary to Jesus, the Catholic faith proclaimed and preserved. Hope to see you here every week. Catholic.com with Tim Kilcoyne in the beauty of fall. And, uh, well, what just happened to me tonight or late this afternoon, I went to play the great game of golf. And uh, and afterwards, went to have a little bite to eat at the local clubhouse and just so happened to stumble upon a comedy night, kind of like those comedy clubs that people go to that are supposed to be for adults only? I don't think so. Thank God I never do, and now I know why. (laughs) Ladies and gentlemen, we've been talking an awful lot about the diabolical disorientation that's upon us, prophesied by Our Lady to Sister Lucia of the Fatima message. Well, I felt like it was just tangible. I could touch it as I listened to this trash that was loaded with swear words. And you know which one, of course, is most prominent in these kinds of presentations. And I've always believed that any adult that's using this kind of language, certainly over, let's say, 30, has issues. To watch the overwhelming majority of people just laughing up a storm over what would be, without question by any standard of decency, considered to be evil, comes to mind, completely sexually debased, so-called humor. This was more in the mainstream of a regular restaurant that ordinary decent people go to, as opposed to specific comedy clubs that are known for this kind of stuff. So I had to believe that there were people in the audience that just so, like myself, just so happened to be there after having played golf and were offended to the max. I just tried to eat my dessert as fast as I could and get out of there in a hurry. And don't worry, I will be making a phone call to their management to present my opinion, and hopefully it'll be memorable. This would be social justice lived out. I thought to myself, Wow. If this is where America is right now, oh boy, are we in big doo-doo. Because if people's general sense of discernment about what this guy was throwing at us was funny, then clearly everyone's sense of discernment is virtually non-existent, dead in the water, beyond lukewarm. And it points to my primary point here in our intro, as we will continue on, with Bishop Athanasius Schneider's book, The New Springtime That Never Came, indeed, and our book review, Who Am I to Judge with Professor Edward Sree. But all of it points to the very construct of discernment in the spiritual life. How we go about making good decisions in our lives has so much to do with what we sense spiritually. And that sense, it's like a third eye or a third ear, has to be trained in the Holy Spirit, what we still call a rightly formed conscience, is that which is imbued with truth, wisdom, and most of all, a life of prayer, an ongoing dialogue with our Lord. And I just thought to myself, anybody sitting through this so-called comedy act clearly does not hit their knees at any point during the day, because there's just no way that they could stomach the utter gutter language. And it was really, I thought, a good reflection, a litmus test or or thermometer, morally, of where we're at. And I picked up a little book here called The Art of Spiritual Warfare by Venetius Oforca. And I read very quickly to you the importance right now, if we are to offset this culture of death, of St. John Paul II used to say regularly, then there's going to be a tremendous need for intercessors. I read, And I sought for a man among them who would build up a wall and stand in the breach before me for the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. Therefore I have poured out my indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Their way have I requited upon their heads, says the Lord God, Ezekiel 
chapter 22, verse 30 to 31, Ezekiel prophesied at a time when there was great moral decadence in Israel. It was pervading godlessness and anarchy. People shed blood with reckless abandon. God described them in the prophecy of Ezekiel as a roaring lion tearing its prey and as killing for an unjust gain. The priests were so abysmally debased that they too were doing violence to the law of God and profaning holy things without any qualms. They could no longer distinguish between the holy and the profane the clean and the unclean, Ezekiel 22, 23 to 29. God was appalled to see this happening in the land and decided accordingly to allow the destruction to overtake them as their sins necessitated. For the wages of sin is death, Romans chapter 6, verse 23, and therefore the soul that sins shall die, Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 4. Yet God wished he had reasons not to consume this course of justice and let the consequences of sin consume them. He desired to have grounds to justify his refusal to let this happen. This is because his plans for his people are not to harm them, but rather to give them hope in a future. Jeremiah 29, verse 11. It is for this reason that he looked for a man who would build up the wall, stand in the gap on behalf of sinners, and stop them from destroying them. Ezekiel 22, verse 30. He simply wished someone would intercede on their behalf and save the situation, as Moses did for Israel. In this seeming divine impasse, an intervention by an intercessor through prayer will be most cherished by the Lord. That is why he looked for someone who would build a wall before him on behalf of sinners and stop the imminent evil. When the people of Israel sinned against God, God could have wiped them off the face of the earth but for the intervention of Moses. This people committed idolatry, which God considers the most abhorrent of sins. What made this sin very grievous and damaging was the fact that they had just crossed the Red Sea and sung the might and power of God. He gave them light. He provided them with manna daily and water from the rock. They had abundantly experienced his power as God. How could they now mold a calf and bow down to it and proclaim, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt? Exodus chapter 32, verse 8. It had taken only a few days while Moses, who was receiving the Ten Commandments from God on Mount Sinai, was absent from the camp. They had no reason whatsoever to commit this grievous sin. This was why the anger of God burned so fiercely that he said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them, but of you I will make a great nation. This is a divine decision. Israel had sinned gravely, and God is justified in his anger and decision. But the curious questions here are, why did he tell Moses about it? Why did he complain to him? Why did he not do it without the knowledge of Moses? Why did he seek permission from his servant Moses and say, Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them. Moses was acting as the bridge between God and his people. God respects both Moses as his faithful servant and his office of mediation between him and his people. He actually wanted Moses to intervene so that he could lean on Moses as the reason to nullify the logical implementation of his divine justice without being an unjust God. God sought the permission of Moses. I simply say, ladies and gentlemen, you can be Moses. You may not be called the holy orders, Oh, that's fine. If they're not doing their job, then what? It's up to you and me, God's simple children of simple faith, to intervene and do little acts of sacrifice in atonement for the sins of the many. And God is not looking at numbers. He's looking at sincerity of love for all God's family. So you and me play this role. And I beg you, just as I wanted to get out of that little clubhouse as fast as I could, I went home to start this show immediately. This was my way of trying to do what little I could to offset the sins of the many. Fully on display in what we would call evil laughter. So please, in your prayer at home, with your children, offer up little acts of sacrifice and prayer, and he may well stay his hand of justice. And after looking at a recent interview with Father Jim Blunt on Grace Force with Father Rick Heilman and Doug Barry, you've got to listen to the story by Father Heilman about the increase in frequency of a little apparition he's been experiencing in his priesthood for many, many years called the miracle of the sun. He has seen the sun dancing in the sky, changing colors, exactly like Fatima in 1917. And the anniversary of this miracle of the sun was yesterday, October 13th. 
And in recent years, this little apparition has been increasing with great frequency to the point now that he's seeing it every week, almost daily. So check your watch. Okay, let us get to a question at least before we have our break with Bishop Athanasius Schneider, indeed a wonderful intercessor for our Lord. From the book, The New Springtime That Never Came, question is posed. In the foreword to Taylor Marshall's Infiltration, you wrote that the modern world has been built on the principles of the French Revolution. Quote, the absolute freedom of a man from any divine revelation or commandment, the absolute equality that abolishes not only any social or religious hierarchy, but even differences between the sexes, and a brotherhood of man so uncritical that it even eliminates any distinction on the basis of religion. If this diagnosis is correct, can Christians still survive such a world? Bishop Athanasius Schneider. Indeed, we have been witnessing an increasingly fierce attack on humanity as such. The French Revolution was a symbolic breakthrough. It was then that the ideas propagated by Freemasonry became known on a large scale. The first target of their attack was divine revelation itself, the supernatural. If you reject revelation, if you reject the existence of God as the lawgiver, ultimately you reject the order of nature created by him. The order of nature in itself is also dependent on divine revelation. We are talking about God's natural revelation and on the laws that God instituted in nature. The order of nature can exist only when those laws are observed. One such fundamental law of nature, a law that is most obvious and necessary, is the existence of two sexes, the existence of man and woman. This is the root of the existence of society. Creation must observe these limits set by God. Down to the smallest cell in our bodies, each of us is either a man or a woman. This is why God has made us, and these boundaries must not be crossed. Freemasonry, which has rebelled against God, ultimately wants to destroy the order of nature that flows from him. That is why we are now being told, no, why should we remain within the limits of what man is or what woman is? It's not fair that God decreed it this way, and neither that which is male nor that which is female are binding. Let everyone create anew, whatever they feel like. Man has to be God unto himself. The existence of two sexes comes from God, but we reject this. We must make our own creation. Instead of two sexes, we will introduce many genders. It is the ultimate perverse result of the idea of absolute equality and freedom. If quote-unquote genders are determined by arbitrary will, the order of creation is destroyed. There is one thing the rebels cannot achieve. They cannot transcend the boundaries of the physical world. If you put your hand in fire, you will have to withdraw it or else you will get burnt and hurt. This law can't be changed. Similarly, they can't get rid of the sun, the moon, or the stars. The universe will keep moving until God in his wisdom decides to say enough. They are not able to change that. They can't control the basic laws of biology. I'm thinking of uh, another video by the great Father Chad Ripperger on the principle of evidence and he makes a comment relative to a very well-known politician currently who made the comment well you may have the facts on your side but we have the truth <laughs> there's the disconnect ladies and gentlemen i think there's supposed to be a little correlation between the facts of evidence and the truth but not in the subjective minds and will of certain people that want to create their own reality. The whole principle of truth rests on objective reality that is real whether you want it that way or not. So this is what we're up against. The final assault of Satan is on the family. This is all prophesied by Marian prophecy all through the centuries going back to 1631 for sure. And everything is following the playbook as long as unrepentance remains the response. And that's why I say, look at your watch because God's not going to have any of it. Eventually everything is going to be turned right side up, but we pray that we can avert disaster in the meantime. And that's where intercession absolutely plays the key role. So let us make God proud with the little acts of sacrifice and atonement wherever you are for the insanity that is indeed upon us at your local school board committee meeting. And make sure you get to it. This is WQPH Radio 89.3 FM on the other side. We will continue on with our book review, Who Am I to Judge? Also for your school board committee meeting. Here's a love song that should be sung to God by Sherry Pita, If I Had You. I could show the world how to smile. I could be glad all oh. 
I could turn the gray skies blue if I had you. I could leave my old days behind, leave all my pals and never mind. There's nothing I couldn't do if I had you. mountain sail the mighty ocean wide I could cross the burning desert if I had you by my side I could be a queen uncrowned humble or poor rich or renowned there's nothing I couldn't do if I had you. Okay, so in our last session, Professor Sri was referring to the funeral, your funeral, and how you would like to be remembered for good reason. What he's trying to do is get us to shift our focus away from specific gotcha moments in the realm of ethics as to how you would behave under such and such a situation, but rather asking the bigger question, what kind of person do you want to become? And that means you have to seek out virtue in your life. As he highlighted, the eulogy usually points in the direction of being a kind and generous and honest kind of person that was always there for others and lit up the room whenever they walked in, that kind of thing. In other words, we want to be remembered for the good traits of our behavior, not necessarily what position we took on climate change, which means you want to be a virtuous person. Are you doing things because you want to become a better person, a better version of yourself? That's a much bigger question. And those people that take an absolute morally relativistic stance regarding everything, in other words, anything goes, first need to be embraced, not confronted. We're not going to go to the public square for the great debate. We have to, as I said in the last show, I think we may have to go shopping with them first. Professor Sri says, So friendship with God and neighbor is what life is all about. That's why when we ponder the end of our lives, we tend to say we want to be remembered for what matters most, being a good neighbor, a good friend, a good sibling, a good spouse, a good parent, a good citizen, a good child of God. This is our end goal. This background is helpful for engaging moral relativism. When talking with relativists, It's important to frame our individual choices in the larger context of our life story instead of viewing them as isolated random acts that have no meaning. If that were the case, it wouldn't matter what we choose to do with our lives. But in reality, our daily decisions, the way we treat our spouse, the way we work, what we watch, how we deal with adversity, how we talk about other people, should be seen within the narrative of our lives, where our lives are going and who we are becoming. Our relativistic friends can always come up with some excuse or argument denying that something is wrong or justifying some action, but sometimes we need to break through the webs of rationalization and simply ask the very personal question, what kind of person do you want to become? This helps frame one's moral choices within the larger narrative of one's life. Our individual choices really do matter. They lead us in one direction or another, either closer to the kind of person we want to be or farther away from that goal. He says most people are not absolute relativists. The average person would probably admit some things are wrong. Things like murder, stealing, rape, kidnapping. We should avoid hurting other people. But when it comes to our private affairs... 
It's assumed everyone should be free to do whatever he wants with his life, as long as he's not harming others. There, in people's personal life choices, relativism should reign supreme. The underlying assumption here is that what we do in our personal lives does not affect other people. It is this modern supposition that we must now address. And I'm sure every high school teacher has heard this one. Who cares if I spend 10 hours a day playing video games? What I do in my free time doesn't matter. If I want to play till 3 a.m. each day, that's my choice. Similarly, if a man wants to sleep with his girlfriend, what's the big deal? If she's a consenting adult, what can be the problem with that? If a millionaire doesn't give from his abundance to help those in need, or if an elderly person wants to end his life, these are all personal choices. And whatever they choose to do in their personal lives is right for them. Each person is free to do whatever he wants as long as he's not hurting anyone. And here's a good analogy relative to what C.S. Lewis refers to as the morality inside each individual, as opposed to social justice. Imagine if all I had to do to prepare my teenage daughter to drive a car was to hand her the Department of Motor Vehicles handbook and have her study it. Let's say I even had her memorize every rule of the road. What would happen if I then handed her the keys and said, you can drive the car now, just don't get into any collisions? How well do you think she would do? She might know she was supposed to drive on the right side of the road, stop at red lights, and never cross the double line. She might know all the rules and even sincerely desire to follow them. But that's not enough. If she had not been trained in the skills of using the accelerator, touching the brake, and turning the steering wheel, she is likely going to crash. Simply telling her not to crash into other cars is not enough. Similarly, unless individuals are trained in generosity in their so-called private lives, they are going to do selfish things that will hurt other people. Unless individuals are formed in courage and taught to endure suffering for the sake of what is good, they will do cowardly things that hurt other people. Unless individuals are trained in chastity, sobriety, and other forms of self-control, they will do out-of-control things that use and hurt other people. Social harmony is built on the inner harmony of individuals. A great society is built not just on good laws, but fundamentally on men and women of great moral character. Or as C.S. Lewis put it, you cannot make men good by law, and without good men, you cannot have a good society. A few analogies, ladies and gentlemen, come to mind. In the political realm, I've brought this up before, we do seem to have the cart before the horse. When you have a presidential election, you get the impression that the only thing that matters whatsoever is one's economic policies. And no doubt, not to diminish the importance of economic policies, but rarely in a presidential debate, do you ever hear basic questions regarding moral character? I'm still waiting for anybody on the stage to simply ask one of the candidates, who are you? What influences have worked heavily upon you through the years? Like, what were your mom and dad like? Especially spiritually. And what do you think about lying, cheating, and stealing? Is this something that we can do from time to time if it justifies the end? The party's political goals? These are the kinds of questions that we might be able to use as a criteria for voting because we don't know whose economic statistics are absolutely spot on versus not. But we can kind of tell when somebody's speaking from the gut, honestly, about really meaningful type issues. And yet, we only get crickets when it comes to this kind of direction of the, of the debate. It never goes in that direction. So we never really know who we're really voting for. So this is an example where, yes, you know, we think that politics rules the day, that it's all about the social policies enacted. And yet what we really see today is political candidates bought off, okay, by special interests, etc., in both parties. And they live very comfortable lives, you know, in the uh, upper middle class suburbs of Virginia and Maryland and whatnot near the Beltway. And they're comfortable and they don't want, want to rock the boat on behalf of Joe Middleman America. So they kind of hold their position politically almost like that of a country clubber. They're all in together and they're very comfortable. And thus, it's all good when you keep on spending into the trillions our money. If we just voted good people 
into office as opposed to political career-minded lifetime political operators, then we might have a chance to create that harmonious outside world which could be conducive to the inner harmony that we all seek for ourselves. But it's not dependent on that outside world harmony. It still goes back to the finding of one's peace before the Lord to create a culture of solid individuals, collectively working together for the good of the whole. So what is truth, Pilate said, to truth himself, our Lord Jesus, sarcastically, is no different than the modern citizens who says, who are you to judge? This is not a person seemingly interested in the virtuous life. But we are at WQPH Radio 89.3 FM. We'll get back to it next week. And do check out the 2019 version of the Fatima story called Fatima. It's excellent. God bless everyone. Let your light shine. That is what it's all about here at WQPH Radio 89.3 FM. But we need to hear your story. You want your voice to be his voice. That is making the faith known to others. Please My number is 877-625-3727, Tim Kilcoyne, TalkCatholic.com. St. Mother Teresa told us, your ministry is your work right where you are. Grab on to this microphone. God bless.